man, that was really fun. All right, I've taken a little while to kind of collect my thoughts, and I'll be real, I didn't really collect them. I just needed a minute to get the adrenaline high down from the end of that race, and I gotta say, that was one of the most fun races of the year. Let's just start off with the big one right here, the finish. The finish of that race, in my opinion, is what NASCAR should strive to have. It shouldn't strive to try and force pack racing. It shouldn't strive to manufacture entertainment or throw BS cautions at the end. That right there, just two guys, man on man, one chasing down the other, trying to figure out any way possible, while the person in front is trying to hold the other guy off. That right there is NASCAR. That's the NASCAR I know I grew up with, the NASCAR a lot of people watching grew up with, and I think it's a NASCAR that a lot of people and most people enjoy. Kyle Larson flying it down in there in what he called a video game move was one of the most odd, unique, but at the same time fun finishes that I've ever watched as a fan. And I really thought we were about to see another repeat of like Craven v. Bush from 2003. Just two guys beating and banging to the finish. Of course, due to video gaming it, Kyle Larson damaged his car enough that he couldn't keep up with Hamlin after that corner. But you know what? It was worth a shot. He wasn't going to win if he just did the normal, oh, go in a different line and then just wash up the track while Hamlin got away. So you know what? I applaud Larson for thinking outside the box. That was fun. But what's the root cause? I think that's what we should be asking here. Why was this race really good? Well, I think first off, we need to really just come to the realization that Darlington Raceway is seriously becoming NASCAR's best track in a lot of ways. I don't want to say it's the definitive best. I know my personal favorite is Martinsville, but I will say, Darlington has flown up the rankings for me as a fan over the past couple years. It doesn't matter what aero package or horsepower you put in the cars, they always run really well there if you just let them race. I think the big one is tire wear. I mean, you could see the difference when Truex pitted about nine laps after everybody else. His car was like Superman out there, zipping and zigging and zagging all through the pack. And he was able to do so because he had fresh rubber under his car. He was able to maneuver the car around and he was a smart driver. Because tire wear is good at tracks for racing, obviously, because of having the driver slip and slide around and having to control the car. But I will say, it's even better when you have drivers who know how to save their tires. And I don't know about you guys, but I really find that saving tires seems to be becoming a lost art in NASCAR. The old veterans seem to know how to do it, and then the really talented guys like a Larson would know how to do it. But it seems like a lot of these younger drivers just burn up their tires early because a lot of them don't have to have very long runs like this on really abrasive surfaces just because of the way that NASCAR has gone, whether it's throwing cautions or stage cautions or whatnot, maybe shorter races. It causes drivers to not really have to be put in that scenario much anymore. So that's something that I really found unique and fun about this race. And it's something that Darlington is famous for is just the fact that you had a ton of strategy, tons and tons of strategy during the end of this race. You had guys trying to make it on two stops at the end, others trying to make it on three, looking for fresh tires versus getting basically good fuel mileage and trying to kind of shortcut the end of the race. I can't remember if it was Dale Jr. or Steve Letard or Jeff Burton. One of them had said that it's approximately 42 seconds around under green when you go down pit road, pit, and go back out. 42 extra seconds. So the crew chiefs of Denny Hamlin and Martin Truex Jr. were trying to figure out if they're fast enough, if they do a certain strategy, if they can cut within that 42 second range and gain position and possibly sneak in a win. And in the end, that strategy is what propelled Denny Hamlin to get in the position to win the race. Kyle Larson was the dominant guy all day, but it was the strategy and the pit calls and really the stuff on pit road that cost him the race. 
And I think that's a product of what Darlington's racing is. Very long green flag racing where you have to save up your stuff, make sure you're good for the long run, and have awesome strategy with it. Now, I think another part of this is the 750 horsepower low downforce package. Because what that really offered was less full throttle racing and much more throttle control. And in the end of the day, much more of saving your tires, saving your stuff, and having a bit more say as a driver of what you could do. Yeah, Denny Hamlin held Kyle Larson back with dirty air, but that's just a problem with the Gen 6 in general. And let's be real, that's a problem in racing in general. Dirty air is always going to be an obstacle for the car following the leader. It's something that Larson had to make up for, which he did at the end. He just wasn't able to do so fully. Plus, having some aero dependency whatsoever in racing doesn't mean it's bad. I found it absolutely fascinating as a fan watching Hamlin try to cut off the line of Larson so Larson couldn't get any clean air on his nose, and Larson having to search for different lines to try and keep up with Hamlin, especially as the run went on when the high side was quite clearly the line to go with. So you know what? I felt like this race had the perfect blend of aero dependency, just enough that a driver had to be smart to fight against it but not enough that it ruined the entire day. And a fun twist that was thrown into this Darlington weekend that wasn't in the one even in the spring was the fact that they repaved about 700 feet of turn two. I think that this is a blueprint really for what NASCAR tracks, Speedway motorsport tracks in general, all tracks that NASCAR runs on should really look at. You don't have to repave the entire track, you can just do the sections that need it most. If you want, you can even be like your own grip strip. I found that it really changed the way that they drove the track and it made that corner a lot faster, which I think is why it made it more treacherous. That kind of leads into the playoff madness. There was tons and tons of crazy stuff going on just in the playoffs alone when it came to the drivers. I mean, first off, you look at the early troubles that Bowman had with the flat tire, and then it also involved Byron. You look at the crash that McDowell had coming out of two. You look at Kyle Busch's problem, and, well, added problems after he left the car. You look at Byron's car getting finished off, Blaney's brakes exploding, and Elliott having a flat tire because the drivers didn't realize he can't race three wide coming out of turn four. The track made these incidents possible because the track was harder than the drivers anticipated it being to drive on. They got too aggressive, they got too comfortable, they got too whatever you want to say it is, and they push the limits. This is a track that thrives on drivers pushing limits. Again, I look back on Craven v. Bush. And for this reason, and for the other reasons I was talking about, as well as the history of this event, the Southern 500 needs more respect. I just want to say that right now. When you look at all these other crown jewel races that we've had in the past, whether it's the Daytona 500, the Coca-Cola 600, or even when it was running the Brickyard 400, these are all races that have huge amounts of advertising have huge amounts of hype and are run on the main networks of fox and nbc not fox sports one or nbc sports network or usa network or whatever the hell they want to put it on this race deserves to be seen as one of the crown jewels right up there with the coke 600 and the daytona 500 and the fact that it kind of got pushed to the side is just wrong, in my opinion. Especially for the fact that there's no football, there's no real pushback, there's no real competition against this race. NBC, I think, is really missing out on a big payday. And speaking of NBC, it wasn't like the broadcast was bad. I thought the broadcast was great. Even though this isn't the throwback weekend, they still had a throwback booth at one point, and they seem to really be going all out and going a lot more in depth than usual, and really just making the broadcast a lot more fun for a viewer like me to watch at home. Again, I haven't watched a broadcast live from NBC since Watkins Glen. I've been at these races in the past month, so coming back to it and seeing such a vast improvement from the weeks that I watched before going to races was a really welcome sight. I think overall, this race was probably, in my opinion, a 9 out of 10. I really thought that this was a great race. I liked how it just sort of built on itself as it went, kind of like a good story. 
And I saw a comment, I can't remember what video I saw it on that was kind of reviewing or talking about the race or it was like a, a part of the race, but they said it was like a Jimmy Page solo. Really sloppy, but really fun to listen to. And I think that perfectly explains this race. It was a very sloppy race, but I've given my rating nine out of 10. I want to know what your rating for this race is. What did you think of the 2021 Southern 500? Let me know down in the comments below. While you're at it, leave a like on this video and share this video and subscribe to the channel for more NASCAR content like this in the future. And also, thank you very much to all of the channel members who support this channel. I appreciate every bit of your generosity. So until next time, have a good one.